Uh, I'm Mark Sheehan. I, um, uh, I'm a senior lecturer up at the Faculty of Education and um, my uh, areas in secondary education. I'm the program director of a secondary program and I, um, I do a lot of work to do with, uh, as far as research is concerned, on um, how, how young people learn how to think critically about the past, what we call historical thinking, uh, and sort of remembrance of, and of, uh, of the past and how people shape memory around uh, what's happened in the past. Well, I'm interested in the whole nature of historical thinking uh, and, and that the um, ideas around how young people sort of make sense of the past through a particular framework, of, a disciplinary framework of thinking what history is. Um, but I think what this project does is it actually <clears throat> looks at it through the lens of what um, uh, the sort of changes that come towards how we think about history and the way we learn history uh, and through sort of digital technologies and the digital world, which is reshaping to some extent uh, the way that um, uh, people interact with the past. And that's interesting from an education point of view because um, the way that young people will think about the past, the way that they interact with it and already interact with it through things like gaming, um, is something that we don't know a lot about. Um, so for example, <clears throat> I had a um, conversation recently with a young, young man who had been to the Colosseum uh, in Rome uh, and he was really disappointed because he had spent um, several years gaming uh, and, 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 and um, looking at sort of movies and film, but, but particularly gaming. Uh, and his whole image of what the Colosseum was, was much bigger and grander. He, and I think that's what this project allows us to do, is get a sense of what that means for the digital world. I think what it also does is it, is it fits around what and this project we talk about is threshold concepts uh, and historical thinking, we call them historical thinking concepts, that the way that uh, we know young people make sense of the world um, effectively, or all people to some extent, is that um, through having uh, a rich conceptual way of thinking rather than simply um, learning a whole lot of details. If all they learn is a lot of details and being able to make sense of those, being able to put them into sort of any coherent pattern, um, it's quite difficult. So that combination of sort of the digital world and threshold concepts uh, through the lens of historical thinking uh, is something that's pretty exciting to me. So I guess my, my view into history came from um, a sense first of just seeing history as stories, as narrative, uh, and powerful stories that very resonated with me personally for all sorts of reasons. Um, but latterly, it's become, although that storytelling narrative is still there, and I still read a lot of history, and <clears throat> it's still very much part of who I am, I've become much more interested in the way that the past is shaped and the way we think critically, and particularly thinking critically through those core sort of historical thinking concepts. Well, I mean, I think what drives a lot of that research for me these days is that um, We've seen generically <clears throat> uh, in, in education over the last 10, 15 years a real shift away from thinking um, through a disciplinary lens, uh, much more towards an idea of thinking generically <clears throat> about um, uh, generic thinking skills. And I think that what concerns me is that really that disciplinary subjects have a particular contribution to make to how young people make sense of the world because they've been around a long time, typically. They're informed by what academics are doing and what sort of research is going on. And at the heart of that, old, that sort of knowledge that comes from that, what comes out of a subject like history, is it's not fixed. It's not belief. It's always fallible. It's always open to interpretation. Uh, there's not sort of um, one version of the, uh, the, 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 the causes of the First World War, and people think we've done that, we'll move on. There are constantly, this is being revisited and thought about, and it will be for as long as that's seen as being of interest to, uh, to people. And so that's sort of knowledge. Um, what some researchers, um, <coughs> people that come out of that idea of social realism or critical realism talk about it as powerful knowledge, is something that should be embedded in schooling. It should be embedded in the way that students learn to think, that not all, valid, not all knowledge is <coughs> equally valid. 
uh, and it does different things. The sort of knowledge you need to know how to um, uh, to to um, <coughs> uh, to fix a uh, <coughs> fix a car is different from the sort of knowledge you need to be able to make sense of a historical past to be able to think critically. And so, when I think about sort of things that engage young people in learning, um, the way into that is typically through narrative. It is typically through storytelling. It is typically through um, just simply engaging with those, those raw materials or details of what, um, what, what, some, what happened in the past. But within a relatively short time, what good teachers need to do, uh, whether they be in a secondary school or in a tertiary setting, is that they need to start to feed in those ideas that there are different interpretations of this. So if we think of different interpretations of colonisation in New Zealand. Um, there's not simply um, <coughs> a Pākehā interpretation or a Māori interpretation. There are a number of different interpretations within the Māori world, within the Pākehā world, within the international arena, uh, that what happens in New Zealand is part of a, um, a much wider story of colonisation in the 19th century that, that's, um, than just what happens here. And so when you want young people to engage with those sorts of uh, um, features of the past, which particularly if they're uncomfortable, particularly if they're controversial, and particularly if they're contested, uh, that you need them to be able to have some sort of a framework to be able to think about why these are contested, and be able to have some sort of framework of being able to understand um, that there are different views, but not all those different views are necessarily the same, and how to make some sense of it. And I think that comes back to what I said before, that really the ultimate contribution that studying history makes at whatever level you study it, um, is it, is it <coughs> um, prepares young uh, people to be able to not just think critically, but to be able to engage with complexity uh, and be comfortable with that. And I guess it's sort of, it's interesting really because <coughs> for a long time, <coughs> initially what my work was on, was on the notion of historical thinking, critical thinking. So I was, very interested in how students learned <coughs> excuse me, to, um, <coughs> to be able to analyse sources and to, to pull apart different perspectives and things like that. But there's another side of critical thinking, historical thinking as well, which has, has to connect as well. It's what we call empathy, or <coughs> what a <coughs> um, scholar I work with in Northern Ireland where I've been on sabbatical, called, uh, Alan McCulley, talks about a psychological truth. And he talks about the notion of being able to understand something through an emotional lens as well as through a critical lens. And that's something that, um, uh, that needs to sit alongside it. So for example, <coughs> I remember when I was in um, Northern Ireland, <coughs> I was there on sabbatical in 2010, um, and I was in Londonderry or Derry, it's called, you know, Protestants and call it London Derry and, <laughs> and uh, Catholics call it Derry. <coughs> so the buses flash both as they go, as they're driving along. Um, and, you know, Northern is an interesting place to study historical thinking because <coughs> it's um, a place where there are these two very powerful narratives, these two very powerful stories about the same place and where both those people have a strong sense of place and a strong sense of their roots are in this place. But it's a, a, a history which, as we know, is highly... Um, troubled and conflicted and um, I was working in a, with a group of, of, um, uh, of scholars who were trying to break down division in the workplace, community activists, trade unionists, through the lens of um, history. Uh, that history is something that people talk a lot about, unusual, no, like New Zealand, history is something we don't talk about very much, this is, it's people talk about history. And while we were there we went and visited the, <coughs> the Bloody Sunday Museum. And Bloody Sunday, which you'll probably know, Bloody Sunday is sort of a, there's a lot of Bloody Sundays in Ireland, but this particular one, 1972, commemorated when the uh, <coughs> um, British paratroop regiment opened fire on a crowd, twelve people were killed, around 40 were, um, were wounded. Uh, and the official account of the merge was that this, these had been IRA, uh, that they, the British were returning fire. <coughs> it was a legitimate action. Uh, that was never accepted by the nationalist <coughs> uh, majority. Uh, and to cut a long story short, uh, although that official narrative continued for a long period of time, under the Good Friday Agreement, a 10-year investigation occurred um, where, um, uh, called the Savile Report, uh, that came out in 2010 that showed that this was actually a massacre. It was, these individuals were not IRA, 
uh, that uh, the British paratroopers had no excuse to fire, uh, and an apology <coughs> was required. And I was there, this um, uh, Cameron, the Prime Minister Cameron, a Conservative Prime Minister, apologised on television to the Irish people for what had happened. And if you know anything about Irish history, a Conservative Prime Minister apologising to the Irish people is pretty poignant, pretty major. Now I remember thinking that, <coughs> that, just, that it had just happened the night before we went up to Derry for this course, and we went to the Bloody Sunday Museum, and I walked into this museum, and there was a, when I walked in, there was my jacket was there. Now, I was a teacher, a secondary school teacher for 20 years, and I was sort of teacher that wore a tweed jacket and a shirt and tie, that was what I was, that's what I did, that's who I was. And, I, and whenever my you know, <coughs> children wanted to lapoon a teacher, they'd put my jacket on, everyone laughed, it was, sort of, it was a stock and trade sort of thing. But I remember walking into <coughs> this museum, I saw this jacket, I thought, what's my jacket doing here? And I walked over towards it, and as I looked at it, I saw just in the shoulder, <coughs> just under the neck, there was this hole. And when I looked up, I saw this photograph above it of this young boy, about 18, 19 year old, wearing this jacket. And the photograph was taken two to three seconds before he was shot dead. And I remember at that time when that occurred, thinking, being able to think critically hadn't equipped me for that. I knew a lot about that. I knew a lot about Irish history. I knew about the Bloody Sunday. I knew about the Savile Report. I had all this critical analytical thinking. But to actually really understand that, I had to understand that on an empathic level. I had to understand it on a psychological level, on an emotional level. I had to be able to think critical thinking, historical thinking, as if we want it to be about connection with other people. It's not just the ability to analyse, not just the ability to critique uh, <coughs> by itself. That can be sort of almost like a parlour game. It's also the ability to be able to think about these broad conceptual emotional sides of the world. Is that, uh, and that has something to say to us, particularly in a country like New Zealand where we are coming to terms with that whole colonisation process and what reconciliation means in an authentic sense and how that sort of works through with that. History is what shapes us. Uh, it, it is whether we know it or we don't. And so often um, uh, you know, it's interesting, for example, we're a part of a project looking with the Ministry of Education at the moment, looking at how we introduce Māori history uh, into schools and what that will actually look like. Uh, and when I work with Māori historians or iwi historians, they talk about the past as though it's living and it's there. It's, it's not something which has um, uh, something that happened and now we've moved on. It's something which is still with us. And I think that's the case whether we know it or not. Uh, I mean, it's sad that so many young people in New Zealand leave school without any real sense of why this place is the way it is, uh, of why they, we have the names we have, of why people live where they live, of why some people are troubled and concerned about things that happened in the past and other people are not. But whether they know that or they don't know that, it's still there. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, and all of us are shaped by the past, whether we think about it and accept it and walk with it or whether we simply just pretend it hasn't happened. Um, and that's, I guess, the way through that, is that, that way of through something like historical thinking. Because what historical thinking does with its very clear framework of what history is, which comes out of academic disciplines. So historians tend to argue a lot about um, different interpretations, and they argue about what history should be taught and what history shouldn't be taught, all those sorts of things. Those things are there, but primarily most history historians sign up to a particular way of thinking what history is. That it is about evidence, it is about different interpretations, and that the past is not a, a narrative, is not fixed, it's always open to change. All those sort of things are, are part of a scholarship which is there. And that's, to some extent, when we look at those sort of areas we talked about before with, <coughs> um, that are contested and, and difficult, uh, for young people to engage with, it, but, um, uh, for people to engage with, then historical thinking sort of sets up a, a framework that makes that relatively um, comfortable to some extent. If you're looking, for example, at uh, the part of where you come from, a part of the world where uh, you know, widespread confiscation of land in the second half of the 19th century and the impact that had on, um, uh, on Māori in that area, then if you have an historical framework for that, you are able to sort of look at evidence, you're looking, you have to look at the complexity about that, you'll be able to actually have a conversation about that. 
If you haven't got that, all you have is a morality play. All you have is a good and bad. Uh, and that doesn't take you anywhere. It just makes you talk past each other. Um, and so history is something that without history, we can't really have those conversations in a meaningful way. We can't really have those, um, uh, that, that ability to sort of move to reconciliation in all its different myriad of forms in that complex way, in a way that's going to be authentic and ongoing uh, and, going to long, and, and be long lasting. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it is. I think if you work in an area like I do, it's sort of um, <coughs> working with um, preparing, educating secondary teachers, uh, and then the, um, the side of it of actually being an academic, you're a bit of an edge walker because you walk, you walk in two worlds and you serve two communities uh, uh, who are not mutually exclusive, but they're not uh, also closely aligned or linked. And so when we think of a phrase like peer review in the world of education or teaching, that's very different to what we mean by peer review in the academic world. And my job is to walk somewhere between that. And so historical thinking, <coughs> I guess, and how it plays out in secondary schooling, um, needs to be informed by what happens in the research community. It's not something that should set apart. Uh, in history, we're quite lucky because we've had um, a lot of historians uh, and good researchers who have been willing to be involved in that whole process. Uh, and some learning areas haven't had that, and they've been the poorer for it. Um, but it's um, one of the aspects of, of a successful subject uh, is when academics are involved, not in control, but where there's this negotiation, this negotiated process between people who uh, teachers who have a strong understanding of pedagogy and what that means, and people who have a strong understanding of what the research discipline side of it means, how that sort of goes together. How is it different? Well, it's different really more in the sense of degree. It's different a bit like, um, um, but it's essentially the same. I mean, we learn anything by doing. Uh, that's the only way we can learn. Um, so we don't learn how to be historians by learning a whole lot of facts and details and, and, and for 10 years and then suddenly we get to university and think, oh, right, and now we're going to learn how to think critically about that. It doesn't work. You need to learn how to think critically, gradually, almost like a, so a bit like, you know, how do we learn to play a musical instrument? We don't just learn scales and, and chord and, uh, and the relationship between harmony and melody. We learn small pieces of music that are relatively simple and gradually they get more and more complex. And it's much the same on the way that people learn how to think critically, or learn how to think historically. Um, that young people <coughs> at a secondary school need to engage with um, the, uh, the framework of historical thinking through their schooling, <coughs> so that when they, at a, at a firstly quite a simple level, but at a more and more complicated level, uh, as they get through the secondary school and then into, the, uh, into a tertiary setting. And I guess from, a, from putting the other hat on, <coughs> from someone who's, who's primary interest in research is about how teachers learn how to think historically and, and can teach their students how to think historically. Um, the, the core um, feature that those teachers need and the ones that success, are successful to have this is they need to understand how the discipline operates. So they're more than storytellers. They're storytellers. They know how to tell a story and to tell a narrative. They know how to stand in front of a group of young people and engage them and inspire them and make them want to learn more. That's what every good teacher has to be able to do. But they're also aware of how to take the discipline apart, of how to take an historical narrative apart and put it back together again in a different way. Because that's really what we're doing <coughs> all the time in the classroom. Whether we're teaching 15-year-olds or we're teaching 25-year-olds, that's really what we're doing is we're pulling up a narrative apart, putting it back together. How does this look different? Pulling it apart, putting it back together. And by doing that, you're not just giving student, young people <coughs> a sense of that the past is contested uh, and we have to understand the interpretive nature of the past. But what we're also doing is we're actually doing something much broader than that. What we're doing is we're sort of equipping them to be critical citizens, people who can live in a democracy in the 21st century <clears throat> and engage and participate constructively in the sort of conversations we need to have uh, to make sense of why the world is the way it is. Uh, and that's what history, through that sort of framework way of threshold concepts or historical thinking concept has, has the capacity to actually do. Well that's, I mean, that's one of the things that drew me so much to this, this project, I probably should have mentioned that initially, that, that, that it is a project that 
steps outside the, <clears throat> um, the bounded nature of how academic disciplines often operate. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and I think the reason it does that is that when uh, it's at the heart of what this project is about, it's about teaching and learning, which is not a primary focus of um, the way that universities often operate. It's a primary focus of how faculty of education operates, but in a wider university setting. And I think when you start to ask those questions like how do young people learn? How do young people learn how to think critically? How do young people learn how to think historically? How do young people learn to sort of engage with threshold concepts, historical thinking concept? Then the answers to those require a whole lot of different perspectives. Uh, and so to work with people that come from different disciplines, um, but still are aligned by this, with, a, with a sense of the past. Uh, that um, it's not science we're talking about here, it's actually the history of science. Um, the, uh, so the, 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 that's those, those sort of connection is really, really interesting to see th the, almost that process of a common language that we're having to sort of, that we speak, but there are different dialects. Um, and when, when we think about what that means and the conversations that you and I have had and, and other people have had, those are really strong conversations. Those are conversations that are, um, have, where I've learned a lot, uh, sort of advanced my thinking. And I think the project is much stronger than that than if it had just been a project that had been much more closely bounded um, from just in the area of, of the academic discipline of history. Being able to draw upon a wide range of, of other disciplines is what makes it powerful enough to go some way towards answering those sort of questions about uh, when it comes to historical thinking in a tertiary setting, what is it that actually makes a difference? Um, what are the you know, are there some important variables we can actually point to to say this is what makes a difference to how uh, students learn how to think? I think history's always been healthy, um, and as a uh, as a subject, uh, not necessarily healthy in, in that it's widely taught in school, particularly in a country like New Zealand that has a, on the surface, an ahistorical approach to <coughs> living here. But I think that. Um, People engage with history all the time in all sorts of different ways. They engage with history through <coughs> the sort of memorials and uh, we see around uh, the, our city where they, they engage with the sort of thing we saw the Anzac Day, they <coughs> watch historical movies, they read historical books, they <coughs> pass reference often without even realising they are, uh, which is actually there. And I think what the digital age is, it gives something different to that because what it gives is that, that capacity to engage with the past in in an in almost virtual time, in a virtual space, uh, which is both <clears throat> exciting but also um, concerning but intensely interesting. Exciting because it does mean that young people can <clears throat> um, uh, have some sense of what it was like to be uh, living in poverty in <clears throat> 18th century uh, London or what it was like to be in a trench in the American Civil War in <clears throat> 1863, all those sorts of things. Massive amount of stuff on the war, of course. American Civil War and the Third Reich and Second World War, that's where a huge amount of, sort of digital um, uh, <clears throat> creation had gone into. And hopefully we'll move on from that uh, at some stage soon. But it's from a cognitive point of view, from a thinking point of view, that does engage people in thinking about the past um, in a way they couldn't before. Uh, and so uh, that's exciting, it has a lot of potential. What it will mean in, in, in reality, I don't know. At the same time, it's also concerning. It's concerning because, when I think of the example I said before, uh, a young person who goes to the Colosseum and is disappointed by what he sees, um, uh, he's only 13, it was fine, <coughs> it's, okay, it's, okay. Um, uh, it's of concern given that, not just simply that, that uh, it's a disappointment, but concern because I wonder if there's something happening about imagination. Because at the heart of good history, and the heart of engaging with the past in, a, um, a, a, in, a, in an authentic uh, um, way, is that capacity to imagine. Historical imagination, all good historians have to be driven by historical imagination. They have to imagine the past. They can't go there themselves. History is a discipline where it's totally abstract. Uh, we can't go back and repeat the experiment. Uh, we, we, all we can do is we can imagine. We can look at the evidence and we can imagine. Now, I think 
digital technologies in the digital world and all those sorts of um, phrases and things, has that, has that potential to do that? In reality, what that will mean, I don't know. And that's why a project like this is so important, because something is happening. Uh, something major is happening. Uh, something major is happening to some extent in a way that is often quite invisible to us in places like university. I think the way that lots of young people are thinking when they are involved in gaming about historical, um, uh, you know, a game like Assassin, for example, when they engage with a game like that, what, what, what are the thought processes there? What do they actually learn? Um, and I don't just mean in the sense of um, they're learning details, and there are some historical details, uh, because history is not really just about details, it's not details that make someone think historically. But we don't know really in a sense what their thought patterns are to how they actually use the past there. So it's exciting, but it's concerning. And that's what makes it intensely interesting, which makes a project like that this, uh, a, a sort of a really exciting project to be part of. And a project that actually needs a range of different lenses to actually look at it, to problem solve what it actually means for teaching and learning. I would say that the same bit of advice I give to, to um, <coughs> when uh, people come to me and say, I want to be a history teacher, what should I study? Uh, and I would say to them, go and study <coughs> something that, well, I say two things. Firstly, go and study something you love, that you're passionate about, and you think is really, really important, and that you can justify what's important. But secondly, study history in a way that makes, gives you access to the contested, controversial, um, interpretive nature of how the discipline actually operates. Uh, I guess study what we need and what's, what we need in, in secondary school teaching <coughs> as we need, and the same I think we need in, 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 in <coughs> uh, tertiary teaching as well in a history sense, is we need teachers who can um, think critically themselves about what they're teaching, about the knowledge they're actually engaging with, and think critically about the nature <coughs> of what that means for teaching and learning. That is not about stories or just about stories. It's not <clears throat> about engagement. It's not about students um, just being interested. All of those things are there, but it's also taking students to that uncomfortable place and giving them those intellectual tools that equips them to actually be able to make sense of the past and think critically about it and think independently and go forward from there. <coughs>